Here's here's the biggest reason Claire, still small voice, is a false prophet. She teaches that after the rapture, there's still a revival and there's still a second chance to get saved. That's like saying after the bridegroom comes, you can miss the bridegroom, Matthew chapter 25. You have to rewrite Matthew chapter 25 in order to say that Claire is teaching the truth. Now here's the biggest problem. If you believe that, and you think it's okay to dilly-dally with God, and you think, well, after the rapture, then I'll get my heart right with God. You see? You understand? That is a clear, false teaching. Matthew chapter 25, let's read it. At that time, he's speaking about the end of the age. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet, to meet the bridegroom. Five were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil along with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. But look, at midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then they, all the virgins, all of them woke up. The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some oil, some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both you and us. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for, for yourself. Okay, so these people were not ready when the bridegroom comes. But while they were on their way to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived. Now, when the bridegroom arrives, that's your rapture. You got to be pretty convoluted to think there's some other rapture other than the bridegroom coming. As a matter of fact, the word rapture isn't even used in the Bible. In the Bible, Matthew called it the harvest, and Jesus called it the harvest at the end of the age. John called it the harvest of the earth in Revelation chapter 14. Paul called it the day of Christ and are being gathered unto him. So it's not even called the rapture. In Matthew 25, it's referred to as when the bridegroom comes. Now here's the rapture already. Are you ready? Here it is. But while they were on their way, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. That going in with the going into the wedding banquet banquet with the bridegroom. That's your rapture. Later, the others also came and said, Sir, sir, open the door for us. Other versions of the Bible says, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, I do not know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. So, when we're looking at the parable of the ten virgins, those who were not ready for the bridegroom when he came were left behind and they were told, I do not know you and the door is shut. As a matter of fact, they found out after the fact, they found out, oh, the bridegroom already came and took those who were ready. And they start calling out to God, sir, sir, open the door for us. Take us too. He says, I tell you the truth. I do not know you. The door is shut. Oh, here's another proof. I know. I'm just proving that Claire from Still Small Voice is a false teacher teaching false doctrine. And the main, all, most of her teaching hinges on this idea that she's making a database of information for people who are left behind after the rapture so they can get saved. I'm sorry, but you're a lying teacher, and you will be held accountable, and you will be proven to be false and proven to be li a liar. As a matter of fact, the Lord was showing me how like the most depth of wickedness is coming from false teachers right now because 
these are the end days and they're fulfilling what is written in God's word about false teachers will arise and mislead many and deceive many. As a matter of fact, I can tell you right now that isn't it clear? Here, here's what here, here's here's what's really clear. Isn't it clear that Joel Osteen is the quintessential perfect example of lukewarm lukewarm teaching and gathering a great multitude and teaching lukewarm false teaching? You may be teaching from God's word, but if you're not rightly dividing the word of truth and teaching the whole counsel of God, you're a false teacher. So if all you're doing is saying, folks, you just be the best you you can be, and we life served you lemons, you just turn around and make it into lemonade. And heck, if you don't even have lemons, you just put a but you just have yourself some sugar water. <laughs> That's basically their attitude spiritually. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. So isn't it clear that Creflo Dollar represents is the perfect perfect representation of an end time teacher who has the love of money? Isn't he like the perfect example of that? <laughs> so in these end days we have lukewarm, which is very clearly Joel Osteen, but not just him, there's a lot of them out there. And then you have the love of money group. Well then you have that witchcraft Jezebel group that Rep, which is also a lukewarm, disobedient spirit that's represented by a still small voice and Claire, and no doubt she's going to have a lot of followers. No doubt about it. <laughs> In these end days. Of course. So if there's a some sort of revival after the rapture, there needs to be at least two or three very clear verses of Scripture that says that. There are none. Matter of fact, there's more. Matthew chapter 25 is a very clear verse of Scripture that makes it very clear that after the rapture, if you miss the bridegroom, you are not going to make it to heaven. You're a foolish virgin, and you've fallen away just before the bridegroom comes. But here's another proof. Luke chapter 17, verse 26. Just This is the words of Jesus, too, so y'all need to get a checkup. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. Everybody who wasn't on the ark. Now, the ark represents several things. The ark represents a history of obedience. In the same way that the oil in their vessel, that also represents, in the, in the foolish virgins, in the wise virgins, that represents a history of obeying God. How do you get more oil in your vessel? Well, the same way that Noah built an ark many, many years ago when it didn't make any sense at all, he started gathering wood and building a structure probably hundreds of miles away from the ocean and at an altitude of over a thousand feet. What sense does that make? He probably wasn't very happy about it either, but he said, you know what? I just know the Lord is telling me to do this. So he had a his he that was him digging down to the rock and building his foundation on the rock and everything that he built was built out of obedience. It was literally hundreds of years of obedience building the ark. If you read the story of Noah, so, why do the wise virgins have extra oil? Well, because they have a history. You go way back to the beginning of their walk with the Lord, and they have a long history of, of laying up treasures in heaven and obeying God. And it's those who, at the last minute, right just before the bridegroom comes, they realize they don't have enough oil in their vessel. In other words, they don't have the history of obedience. Then they just they want the quick fix. They go to the uh, wise virgins and say, Pray for us, lay your hands on us, and transfer the anointing. See, that's what the lukewarm disobedient want. They want a laying on of hands, transfer of the anointing. I'm sorry, but my history, what I've learned, 
I rarely pick t- get too much anointing from from the laying on of hands. Yes, it does happen. Yes, there is power transferred in the laying on of hands. But you know what? I've found my most powerful experience to receive the anointing and to get in the presence of God is just obeying God. And I'll never forget when the Lord spoke to me, he said he said um he sent a messenger who read <laughs> Exactly what Jesus said to the rich young ruler. Jesus said to the rich young ruler, there's one thing you lack. Go sell everything you have. Everything. And give to the poor. Then you'll have treasures in heaven. Then come follow me. That's what Jesus said. And you know what? Peter did it. Peter said to Jesus, we left everything to follow you, Lord. We know Paul did it. Soon as Paul had an experience with God, he basically turned away from being a Pharisee any longer and walked away from everything he had his whole previous life, all the traditions, all the everything that he had built, and he walked away in order to serve Christ and ultimately walked away from everything by living in prison. So Paul did it. Peter did it. We know Elisha did it when he met Elijah. He walked away from everything. Bible says he went and sacrificed his bull, said goodbye to his parents, had a banquet for the poor with the with the bull that he sacrificed and then went and followed followed Elijah. So I remember doing that when the Lord spoke to me back in 1994. But I have to say before that the first time I did it when I first got saved almost everything I had was stolen. I mean I stole everything I had. I didn't And so when I first got saved, I had to give back or return everything that I had stolen, almost everything I had. But then a few years later in 1994, I literally gave everything I have away and walked away from where where I was living with nothing, not even a toothbrush, just the clothes I was wearing. I had a shirt, a pair of pants, some socks, and, and a pair of shoes. And that was a time that I received an, a tremendous amount of giftings and power from God, the anointing, the glory, the touch. It didn't come by the laying on of hands. I didn't just go to the pastor and say, lay hands on me in prayer, I need more power. No, out of an act of obedience, the power I got. How did Moses cross the Red Sea? You know what the Lord once told me? He said, Moses crossed the Red Sea by a simple act of obedience. I said, what? So I got my Bible out and I researched it. Sure enough, you know what God said? Moses didn't have to do nothing. God just said to Moses, go stand over the sea and raise your staff over the sea. That is such a simple, easy act of obedience. Just raise your hand and hold your hand over the sea and the, and the sea will part. Sometimes the act of obedience to get the miracle is the easy part. All you got to do is obey God. But if you look at it in context... That seemed like crazy talk. Think about it. The Egyptian army is coming. Israel is stuck at the, at the Red Sea. They can't go any further. They can see in the distance, here comes the Egyptian army. Here they come. Then the Bible says, <laughs> Moses, God said to Moses, stop complaining. So Moses was obviously walking around saying, God, why would you bring us out to this desert? We're going to die out here. What are we going to do? So God says, stop complaining and go hold your staff up over the sea to part the waters. So all Moses had to do is just walk over there and obey God. And the Bible says that God sent confusion into the Egyptians. So they started to like fight each other. Something happened with the Egyptians. Took them a really long time to just cross the desert while God split the sea. So it was a simple act of obedience of just holding up the staff to get that great miracle. But the Lord told me it wasn't that wasn't the great miracle. That wasn't the hardship that Moses had to go through. The hardship was getting to that place where God would give you a miracle by one simple act of obedience. Now you might say, what's the simple act of obedience? What about the little kid who provided the little fish and the loaves? He was probably like, this is my lunch. He didn't know there was going to be a miracle, but he knew in his heart, I'll just give this. 
Besides, that's the Lord right there asking for it. So I'll go ahead and do it. The next thing you know, there's a miracle. So that little kid who provided his lunch, by his little act of obedience of laying that down at the feet of Jesus, everybody, there was a great miracle even written of in the Bible. And think about how many people were at that meeting that day who had a little sack full of food and thought, no, this is all I've got. This is my lunch. This is all I have. And withheld it. That's what the foolish virgins did their whole life. They withheld from God. They withheld from God. Now when it's a desperate situation, it's the midnight hour, the cry rings out, and suddenly they realize they don't have enough oil in their vessel. And just before the bridegroom comes, they fall away from the faith. That's really what happens. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 9, he says, basically he says, when you are handed over to be persecuted and put to death, at that time, many will turn away from the faith. So how do you know when, when you look at Christianity in North America, there's no way. You can't stand here and tell me all those people are saved. You can't stand here and tell me Creflo Dollar is saved and he's teaching the love of money and friendship with this world. You can't tell me Joel Osteen is saved when he's teaching lukewarm disobedience. You can't tell me Claire, still small voice, is saved when she meets with a demonic spirit and tells people that they don't even have to get their heart right because... After all, you can miss the rapture and be left behind and there's still another chance. That is a lie. And it's very clear in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. But Luke chapter 17 verse 26 says, The flood came and destroyed them all. So there's another proof. You want another proof from the book of Revelation? I'm going to prove to you from the book of Revelation that after the rapture, there is no revival. Revelation chapter 14, starting in verse 6, the gospel goes out to every nation, language, tribe, and people, and then the hour of God's judgment comes and Babylon the Great falls. After that, the mark of the beast comes out. The mark of the beast comes out before the rapture. That's another area that still small voice is going to be rebuked and proven to be a liar in the same way that Renee M. was proven to be a liar. You're going to see the mark of the beast come out and there's going to be a great falling away and everything must be fulfilled exactly as is written in this Bible. Okay, so before the bridegroom comes, the foolish virgins have to fall away. It's written. Jesus said it would happen. Listen, before the end days, you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And at that time, many will turn away from the faith. It's written. It will most certainly happen. Now look at what Paul, uh, John says. The gospel goes out, then Babylon the Great falls. Revelation chapter 9, verse 7 and 8. Then the mark of the beast comes out, Revelation chapter 14, verse 9. I'm going to read it. If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or hand, he too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tor tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. Then, now a lot of people are going to tell you, Oh, well, the rapture already happened before that. Really? Then why does it say in the very next verse, Revelation 14, 12, this calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. You're going to say, oh, those are the tribulation saints. First of all, you just came up with your own idea. There's no mention of anything called tribulation saints. That's your own idea. And if that's the case, then why does God say, Blessed are those who die in the Lord from henceforth, in the very next verse, Revelation 14, verse 13. And then, the harvest of the earth happens in verse 14. So there's your rapture. So 
Here's how it's going to happen. Here's how it plays out in God's word. And here's how it's going to happen. And still small voice is a false teacher and a liar. And I'm going to prove it. The gospel goes out to every nation, language, tribe, and people. Then Babylon the Great Falls, which is going to happen next, has not happened yet as of... Well, in the prophecy of Matthew Smith, he says at the end of February, or somewhere between, I think it was like December through February, winter finds itself here, a sudden disaster will make it clear or something, I can't remember. But, you know, we can expect something to happen very soon. After Babylon the Great falls, the mark of the beast comes out. Then, blessed are those who die in the Lord from henceforth, and you better be ready to stand firm in your faith. Then the harvest of the earth, Revelation chapter 14, verse 14. It's going to play out exactly as is written, right here in God's word. So that's another proof. And proof that there's no salvation after the rapture is in chapter 15. The, the timeline goes on. And God pours out his wrath on the inhabitants of the earth. And in Revelation chapter 16, we see God pouring out his wrath on the inhabitants of the earth. And all it says is that, that everybody on the face of the planet has to drink blood. That's one of the judgments of God. Amen. Praise God. Jesus is Lord. And time is running out.